Amnesia the Bunker is one of the tightest survival horror experiences I've played in years. It's all killer, no filler. A game that I immediately fired up again upon completion. A striking example of a replayable title, in a genre known for replayability. It pulls heavy influence from titles like Alien Isolation while trimming the excess fat. While the narrative takes more of a backseat compared to past works of frictional games, it's still an engaging story. It pulls back on the narrative elements and amps up on the survival horror ones. I didn't find it as scary as their past works, but the experience had kept me on the edge of my seat throughout. It's nice to see frictional games deliver another classic after stumbling with Rebirth. It's a title that's my choice for game of the year as of writing. It's a game that I hope doesn't get lost in the shuffle. It's like how I felt about Signalis from last year. It'll tide me over until the next World War I survival horror I've been anticipating, Conscript. So let's dive in and see what makes The Bunker such a great survival horror experience. Quick note, due to how dark the game could be at times, I did brighten the footage by a slight degree in editing. YouTube doesn't play nicely with dark footage. In the bunker, we play as Henry, a French soldier in the trenches of World War I. It's an interesting start where the trenches serve as the game's tutorial. Gunplay, patching up wounds, making use of explosives, using heavy blocks to clear obstacles. Our fellow soldier and friend Lambert helps us out by providing a gas mask. We awaken later and find Lambert wounded at the bottom of a crater. Giving him a drink from nearby water, we carry Lambert out but the Germans hunt us down. We wake up some time later in the safety of our bunker occupied by French forces. But the bunker is abandoned. It's eerie how quiet things are. We meet one of our fellow soldiers before a monster pulls him away, killing him. Since we've been in a coma, a monster appeared and has killed off the others. Our goal is to escape this bunker, find the required pieces to set off the dynamite to blow our way out of here. Of course, we have a monster to deal with along the way. What's great about this intro is that it allows you to skip it on further playthroughs. Instead, you could start inside the bunker. The trench section is well done, but so nice for the developers to allow you to skip it. For a genre known for replayability, it can be frustrating at times for how long some games take to get going. One example being the Resident Evil 7 intro. Sure, I know to keep a safe handy after the baker's dinner scene. Wouldn't it be nice if you could skip the game intro and start there instead? The original Clock Tower had the option of skipping its intro, one of the earliest titles in the space. Yet it's still a rarity to see in games. That aside, let's get to the meat and potatoes of the bunker. The bunker puts heavy emphasis on resource management. We have limited inventory. We begin with six slots, although we could find more slots throughout, a godsend. Ammo doesn't take up slots. You could drop items anywhere, and there's an item box in the safe room. To save time, space, and trips, I would gather items in key rooms and to come back to if need be. You want to be aware of time. One of the best executed features of the bunker is the power generator, a brilliant stroke of resource management. It's what keeps the lights on, else the bunker is near pitch black. We have a couple of options for light sources, one being this dinky little wind-up flashlight. It only gives a little bit of light that we have to wind up on the regular. It makes a lot of noise. Not good when we have a monster after us. Wow. A torch is another option. It has a short life and requires a lighter. It takes up precious space in our inventory. So the best approach is to find fuel for the power generator. The light keeps the monster more at bay. We have a clock sync to see how much time we have before the generator runs out of fuel. There were times in my playthrough where I'd have a full generator, go about the bunker, check my clock. Fine for time. I'd explore further, encounter the monster, look back at the clock and, uh oh. I'd make a beeline back to the generator to fill it up with fuel I found along the way, dropping items if need be. What happens with the lights out when there's no power coming from the generator? Well the monster is in its element in the darkness. The bunker lives or dies on how well executed the monster is. It's not to the level of sophistication of the xenomorph from Alien Isolation, but it nails its execution. The monster follows us throughout, much more with the lights out. These moments in the dark are the game at its best and most tense. In some stretches I let the power run out, others were cases of poor timing and item management. You could hear the monster lurking about, making its way underneath the surface in the tunnels. It'll pop out of various holes in the wall found throughout the bunker. You could tell if the monster is nearby. The power's on, the lights will flicker when near. There are changes to the music. Dust emerges from the hole in the wall where the monster is. Hey! 
The game doesn't trick you with its appearance. It doesn't pop out of nowhere. Beyond the beginning and the end of the game, there's only a couple of scripted moments of his appearance. Else is about how you play. Despite its size, it's quite difficult to get a good look at the monster, with the lights flickering or our vision blurring when looking at it. You could get a good, if brief, look by using a flare or fire before it scampers away. That or it's up in our face, at which point we're French toast. Comparing it back to the Xenomorphs from Alien Isolation, it doesn't have the super sophisticated AI, one that learns from your past actions and adapts, as far as I know. But with what they're going for here, it didn't need to be. It keeps track of the noise you're making, light, and your health. Leaving a trail of blood while injured isn't going to do you any favors. I felt it had the right balance of appearances. Never too often that it got frustrating, but not to the point where I ever felt safe. I was on edge the entire time. While we can run and hide from the monster, we have many options in their arsenal for dealing with it. I had a lot of fun exploring and tinkering with each possibility, one of them being the revolver. One where each bullet we find is a godsend, a sigh of relief. It might take a shot or two or three to drive the monster back. Grenades are another source, whether a frag or gas. The game threw me for a loop with how long it would take for grenades to go off. I had many deaths as a result not timing my grenades right against the monster. As well, gas grenades leave a large trail that lasts for a long time. Not the best situation to be in when you need to get back to fuel at the generator and don't want to hurt yourself. You could find a gas mask to avoid this issue, but again that burns up an inventory slot. There are explosive barrels and gas canisters found throughout the bunker. You could set them off yourself or get the monster to. One time he ran an explosive barrel in the way with enough force to set it off. Fire is another way to fend off the monster. Also a great way to get a look at it for a brief moment. You could pour fuel on the floor to light with a lighter or find fuel already on the floor. This being one of those decisions you have to make. Do you use that fuel for refueling the generator or do you make use of it to drive off the monster? I found this decision making popping up more in later stretches. As well, we can combine fuel with bottles and cloths to make petrol bombs to chuck at a monster for some good revenge. There's great relief in driving the monster back, if only for a short time. The monster isn't the only hurdle we're dealing with. There are several traps throughout the bunker. The first trap I came across in opening one of the soldier's quarters doors threw me for a loop. Setting off a grenade isn't the best idea in trying to avoid the monster. <laughs> It's easy to turn a corner and step over a wire trap if you're not paying attention. There are a number of moments where I tense up jumping over a wire trap. Another hurdle is accessing rooms. Many lock doors to open without a key. Some we could access through vents, although some vents need a wrench to open up. You can shoot the door or the lock or toss a grenade. Of course, this wastes precious resources and makes plenty of noise for the monster to find. Another option is using a large brick to break down doors or locks. Something that's taught to us in the tutorial. You have to keep an eye out for them. There'd be points I'd go back and grab a brick to break down a door on the other side of the bunker. I want to save those precious resources for other situations. But the most interesting hurdle of all are the rats. They'll be feasting on corpses throughout the bunker. They'll block access down hallways. Trying to run by or jump over them ends up in Henry taking much damage, which is an easy way for the monster to hunt us down. Like anything here, there's many ways to deal with them. You could kill them, but this wastes resources is best left for dealing with the monster. You can use torches to drive them off for a brief time or food to distract them. The way our arsenal and hurdles interact with each other leads to unexpected and delightful results. Scenarios that wouldn't play out the way I was expecting in the best of ways. There are elements of the immersive sim design approach within the bunker. The game gives you the you could solve problems in many ways notification. You could climb through vents. That counts, right? Yeah, we could split hairs here and get ourselves into a tizzy over whether the bunker is an immersive sim. I'll leave that to others who love to debate that. It's more a survival horror title first with elements from immersive sims. I ran into several situations throughout my playthrough that had these interesting interactions. Like trying to approach a group of rats seeing a body. The monster made itself known at the closest hole in the wall which drove off the rats.
Another situation had the monster merging from a hole after I used a brick to break a door down. I shot a nearby gas canister, causing him to flee, at which point he stepped over a wire trap with a grenade. Another situation had me shooting a gas canister to deal with rats. This got the attention of the monster, who tripped himself up on a trap on the way over. So many of these encounters can take a turn in ways you didn't expect. Something that's hard to plan for. Something that's fun to experiment with. Something that keeps the game fresh on additional playthroughs. So let's go through some notable moments in the story of the bunker, so spoilers ahead. There are distinct sections within the bunker. These areas, while close to one another, remain isolated from one another. There are some shortcuts you can lock within each section for ease of exploration. There are only certain spots where you can view the map. While areas can look the same, understandable with the setting, you'll know the bunker like the back of your hand. It's not a large area, but it's designed in a way that there's no wasted space. With everyone dead or having fled, we'll piece together the story through journal entries in the environment. Save for moments during the intro and reading his own entries, Henry remains silent. But I won't be going. How can I be so sure? Well, Gaston has agreed to a friendly game of chance to determine which of us it will be, and using an old sleight of hand trick, there's no way I'll lose. <laughs> no. Augustin doesn't have a chance, because I'll ensure he doesn't. Compared to Daniel in the Dark Descent, there are but a few notes from Henry. Thank goodness they learned from their mistakes with Rebirth and having a chatty protagonist. From these notes, we discover that Roman ruins lay underneath the bunker. The game being part of the Amnesia series, you could see where this is going. Soldiers make expeditions into these ruins, finding things that should not be. Combine this with a war going on outside, and you have a recipe for disaster in their psyche. The water that we gave Lambert in the intro, it turned him into the monster. You could see some of his work in the chapel, in one of the game's more unsettling sections. What's interesting about the bunker is that the codes for doors and lockers are random in each playthrough. This is a great little touch to help with replayability. One game highlight is emerging from the inside of the bunker for a brief moment. It's so nice to see the sky and outdoors. And then bullets start flying at you. In case you forgot, there's a war going on outside. Another great moment was discovering the safe room isn't so safe after all. This is the spot where you go to take a breather, to save your progress, to go fuel up the power generator. Later on I walk in and, wait a minute, since when has there been a hole in the wall for the monster? There wasn't a hole here, it's there now. That son of a bitch. The game gives us a brief break from the monster in the ancient tunnels. We see things that defy logic. There are things here that should have remained buried. One of these soldiers wanders these tunnels, having lost his marbles and cut out his eyes. When we get all the pieces required, we blow open a way out, further down into these ancient Roman ruins. More questions than answers come up with what's down here. What follows is a pretty disappointing final encounter with the monster, one in which we could run away or deal with him, leading to endings with slight differences. If you found the toy rabbit, something significant to Lambert, you could use it to distract him. It makes it easy to blow out the ground beneath him, killing him for good. Of course, there's only brief relief from escaping. We're then reminded we're in the middle of a war, and then the credits roll. Stein! Stein! An abrupt end, but it is fitting for the setting. It's not like we were going to walk outside to discover that the war is over. There's a nice trip down memory lane with a certain sound if you end up falling down the pit in the final encounter.
And so ends the bunker, at least that playthrough. Survival horror games have always been great for replayability, but slight tweaks made here and there make it even more enticing. The ability to skip the intro and having certain aspects randomize each playthrough keeps things fresh. And it never wears out its welcome. And I said at the beginning of the video that it takes influence from games like Alien Isolation and trims the excess fat, I mean that by its pacing. As great as Alien Isolation is, the game could have chopped off a good 20% of its runtime for a tighter experience. While the story is well done, it doesn't reach the highs of the Dark Descent or Soma, but in its place, it went heavy into fleshing out a strong survival horror experience in regards to its gameplay, some of the best I've come across in recent years. It's nice to see them come back strong with the bunker after Rebirth being a bit of a misstep. Frictional Games has such a strong understanding of creating great horror experiences. I was curious coming into the bunker hearing what they had in mind. Their games have been light on gameplay mechanics. Would they be able to pull off a title in the vein of classic survival horror with dashes of immersive sim elements? The answer is yes. Not the scariest of their games, but it's the most fun. One which makes me excited to see what they come out with next. As of writing, it's my choice for game of the year, and I hope it gets its due. It seems to have flown a bit under the radar compared to other releases. Don't sleep on it, The Bunker is a wonderful game. We live in an era full of mostly unneeded remakes, botch reboots, broken releases, or publishers nickel and diamond customers. The Bunker is a nice reminder that there are still passionate developers out there focused on making quality original games first, and making money second. Thanks for watching. Boulder Punch out. Oh no.